Hello folks, J. Scott Phillips here and welcome to my channel. Today we are bound once again for the golden age of science fiction. And a couple of months ago, I thought it would be fun to start a series about uh, discussing the history of science fiction. And I decided to start with what is considered to be the very beginning of the golden age of science fiction. And that was with the July 1939 issue of Astounding Science Fiction, edited by John W. Campbell, Jr. And in that video, I talked about why that was considered and is, is widely considered to be the beginning of the Golden Age. And I'll leave a link to it down below in case you're interested. But in that video, I talked about, in particular, the main story in that issue was Black Destroyer by A.E. Van Vogt. That was his first ever published story, and uh, then from there on, Astounding just kept publishing great authors and, and uh, great stories and started to uh, significantly influence the other publications that were also printing science fiction stories. And uh, there was just a, a sea change in the type of stories that were being written and were becoming popular. But before moving on from that very same issue, it would seem wrong to skip over another author that even though it was not his first published story ever, it was his first published in that, in that uh, publication in, in Astounding. Um, and that's Isaac Asimov. Now, he was only 19 years old when that issue came out, but he had already published two other stories in Amazing Stories just earlier that year, just a few months before. So, before moving on to the next issue or future issues of Astounding, it seemed like we should take a little pause, look at uh, the significant entry of Isaac Asimov into the world of science fiction, just maybe in the wee hours of the dawn before the golden age of science fiction, and talk about three stories. And uh, so, uh, let's take a look at those. Isaac Asimov was born in Russia in 1920, just sometime shortly after the beginning of the year. And apparently, no one was really paying attention to the date that he was born. So sometime after, they had to kind of go back and retroactively pick a birthday for Asimov. And they decided on January 2nd. No one's really sure exactly though if that's the exact date or not. But that's what he went with for the rest of his life. So he's... Uh, in the books as having been born on January 2nd, 1920, with a grain of salt. Uh, but when he was very young, he had no memory of living in Russia at all. Uh, when his parents immigrated to the United States and settled in, in New York City, in Brooklyn, and his father owned a candy store there. And by the time Asimov was nine years old, he was already reading the pulp magazines that were in the spinner racks and in the newsstand racks of his father's store and uh, started to fall in love with the science fiction uh, magazines and pulps. He read a little bit of everything, but it was science fiction that really captured his imagination. He would kind of sneak the magazines off the rack and uh, kept it a little bit of a secret from his father because if he had uh, dog-eared a quarter of the magazine or cracked the spine or something like that, his father would get upset because now it was a marred issue and wouldn't be able to sell as well on the newsstand. So he had to be kind of cagey about sneaking those magazines and reading them. But he did that, and, and so that's how he formed a lifelong uh, obsession, not only with reading science fiction, but also with taking very careful care of anything that he read so he wouldn't dog ear it or crack the spine or, or mar it in any way, just because <laughs> in his history, his father would get upset if he damaged the, the book or the magazine. Asimov's first published science fiction story was marooned off Vesta in the March 1939 issue of Amazing Stories. But that was not actually his debut in having his words printed in a science fiction pulp magazine. It was actually in Astounding Stories, his favorite of all magazines, uh, in February 1935 when he had a fan letter published in the column Brass Tacks. I'll put the actual letter up on the screen here so you can read it if you want to pause the screen. But if you don't, uh, basically what he's saying is, 
as a fairly precocious teenage kid, he felt like he had some points to make to the editor of Astounding. This is before John Campbell was the editor. But uh, uh, he had nine points where he uh, said what he liked about the magazine, what he didn't like about the magazine, and some recommendations of uh, maybe some better ideas on how to handle things. So uh, interesting uh, little background into how he was feeling about the magazines and the stories that he loved to read uh, in those days. In 1938, Asimov decided he would start to write his own short stories for science fiction and hopefully get them published. And his first story that he wrote, he had an idea for a time travel story where rather than just being able to travel at will to different points in time, he envisioned time as a kind of a helix shape, kind of a, a he described like a bed spring, uh, uh, the, a corkscrew shape where uh, you could only travel from one point on on the helix straight down or up to uh, uh, another point in time. So you're kind of locked into anything along that, that point in time, not up along any of the other intermediate points of time. And he wrote that story up and thought he would submit it to Astounding, his, his favorite of all the science fiction pulps. And he wanted to take it in and and submit it in person to John W. Campbell Jr. himself. So he got all dressed up in his best suit and took the subway into Manhattan to the offices of Astounding and actually got in to meet with John W. Campbell. Apparently, Campbell agreed to meet Asimov, who just walked in and announced with no appointment off the street, because Campbell was familiar with Isaac Asimov's name because of the letters that he had been writing in to Astounding and from time to time getting published. So he agreed to meet with Asimov and uh, chatted with him for about an hour. And this was a huge moment in Asimov's life, getting to meet his uh, hero and his uh, future mentor in uh, establishing a career in science fiction. So he, he uh, submitted the story and left it with Campbell. And uh, Campbell said he'd get right back to him as soon as he had a chance to read it, but he rejected it. He didn't like the story at all, but uh, he liked Asimov. So I uh, told Asimov that he just lacks experience. He just needs to keep trying. Probably needs to get 12, 15 stories under his belt, polish his style, and just learn by making mistakes, but uh, just to keep trying. So Asimov did that. Now, that meeting with Campbell took place in June of 1938. And uh, so, uh, because Campbell encouraged him, Asimov knew he had to keep writing. So, he started writing his second story that he called Stowaway and took that in to submit to Campbell in July of 1938. Once again, he got in and was able to chat with Campbell for about an hour or so, in, in at which time he uh, submitted the second story, Stowaway. And Campbell rejected that one too. Uh, but he mentioned that it did show improvement over the first story. So once again, that encouraged Asimov to go back home and start working on a third story that uh, he called Marooned Off Vesta. And he liked this one quite a bit, feeling like he was getting a little better at, at this. And so went back to submit that one to Campbell in August of uh, 1938. And once again, got in and was able to chat with, uh, with Campbell for an hour or so again and submitted Marooned Off Vesta to him. And Campbell rejected it. So Asimov knew he had to keep writing. Uh, that was, uh, Campbell had told him that uh, the first time they met, is it might take you know, a, a dozen stories or so before he started to really uh, click. So not wanting to be discouraged, uh, Asimov went back home again and started working on more stories for Campbell. He had several ideas now, and he was just going to keep writing. But in the meantime, he thought, hey, wait a minute, there are other science fiction magazines out there, and why don't I submit the story to one of them? So he took Marooned Off Vesta and sent it in to Amazing Stories, and in October, he got a check for $64, and they told him that it would be printed uh, 
his story would be printed in the March 1939 issue of Amazing. Well, that was great. Now he was going to be published and was uh, encouraged now more than ever to keep writing. Uh, the issue came out in, actually hit the stands in January, a couple months before its cover date. Now, being Asimov's first ever published story, he did not get mentioned on the cover at all. But considering that he was only 18 years old when he wrote it, it's actually a pretty clever story. It's about uh, a spaceship that's out in the asteroid belt, and it gets hit by a, an asteroid and is almost completely destroyed except for a few cabins and an airlock and some outlying equipment, a uh, little contained portion of the ship with, with three spacemen, three guys in there. And the, they're, they have a dilemma here. They have only three days of air left, and they've got like a year's worth of water, which they don't think they're going to need at all. And they can see Vesta uh, a few hundred miles off in the distance. And Vesta is settled. There's a, a, a base there. But they don't have any way of radioing or to send up a flare or anything like that. All they can do is just kind of count out the clock. But they realize they do have some resources in the ship. So if there's anything that they can do, they've got three days to do it. And to use what they have on hand only to save their own lives and somehow get back to Vesta. Now, years later, Tom Hanks would totally rip off this idea uh, for his movie Apollo 13, completely stolen from Isaac Asimov's very first story. But uh, uh, if you have seen any of my other videos, you probably know that I like not only talking about the authors and the stories behind the, the, the stories themselves, but about the artwork. Uh, I'm an art director and a creative director in advertising and marketing for most of my career, so I love talking about art. So let's take a look at some of the artwork for this story. Here we have a nice big double page spread and ink drawing by Robert Fuqua. And he's showing us a key moment in the story here. Now, as I said, they only have three days of air, but they've got a year's worth of water. So the idea that they came up with is... Uh, this astronaut here, Warren Moore, his name is, the spaceman, he's going to go outside the ship and with a heat ray, he's going to burn a hole in the side of a water tank and then that will force the water to expand into steam and blast out of that tiny little hole in the water tank, creating a, a rocket effect. And if he does this right, he can have this pointing the ship at Vesta and being only a few hundred miles away, they should be able to uh, just coast on the steam as a rocket effect there and get to Vesta and save their lives. And I think it's kind of inter interesting to see what a spacesuit, the idea of a spacesuit was back in 1939. Really, it's just nothing more than what a diving suit might have looked like back then with uh, maybe some extra bells and whistles for, for space travel. But uh, really nothing like what we think of a spacesuit now. But uh, not too far off, really, if, if, if you think about it. Now, the artist here, Robert Fuqua, was born Joseph Tillotson in 1905, and he grew up in Greenville, Mississippi. His father owned a print shop in town, and so from an early age, Tillotson was uh, learning printing and how to create ads and flyers for local businesses. And he seemed to have a talent for drafting and layout, so he wound up going to the Art Institute of Chicago, and then he got a job at a Chicago ad agency. And around that time, he started to take on some side work as a freelance illustrator for Ziff Davis, which was the publisher for Amazing Stories and several of the other pulp magazines out of that same publishing house. And to protect his real name in advertising, he took a pen name for the pulp illustration work, Robert Fuqua, which was his grandfather's name. Now, as he was getting started with the with his side gig here, was just about the time that Isaac Asimov himself was starting to get noticed and published. Here are some examples of some of his other artwork from that very first issue that he did any illustration for at all, the October 38 issue of Amazing. And he actually got to do the cover for that 
and several illustrations inside, and here's just one example. Now, Ziff Davis must really have liked Fuqua's art because once he got started with them, he did every amazing cover from the October issue for the next eight months, and also a lot of the illustrations inside for several stories inside each issue during that time. Then someone else did a cover uh, after that, but then he kept coming back and doing more and more covers and illustrations uh, for, for years afterwards. So he was quite an aim with uh, Ziff Davis and Amazing Stories in particular. 20 years after Maroon Da Festa first appeared in the March 1939 issue of Amazing Stories, Amazing reprinted it in their March 1959 issue. And not only did they reprint the original story, but they printed a new story by Isaac Asimov uh, in which the three, the same three astronauts get together for a 20-year anniversary reunion to uh, reminisce over their adventures together, and at the same time they wind up solving a mystery. But the reprint of Marooned Off Vesta this time was illustrated by Virgil Finley. And Finley basically pays homage to the Fuqua illustration from that original publication in depicting the same exact scene and really just, it's even the same layout, just kind of updating the style of the spacesuit for our astronaut there, Warren Moore. And even the lettering, Marooned Off Vesta, is almost identical to that uh, original illustration. Now, I don't feel that this is some of Finley's best work, uh, although it's still pretty good. I think some of it might be because it's derivative of that original Fuqua illustration. But Virgil Finley himself was a fantastic artist for the pulp magazines, one of the very best, I feel, especially in those early days. Virgil Finley grew up in Rochester, New York, and he was inspired early on by illustrators like Howard Pyle, Maxfield Parrish, and Gustav Doré. So quite an impressive group there that uh, he took his inspiration from early on. He worked in gouache and oils, but he was really best known for his exquisite work with pen and ink and scratchboard technique. Now, scratchboard is where you take a white artboard and you paint a layer of black India ink over it, and then you scratch through that to reveal the white paper underneath. You get some really nice, bold, dramatic effects with solid blacks and solid whites, and he was a master at it. Now, when he was 21, he sent some samples of his artwork off to Weird Tales, and the art director there uh, saw it and thought it was tremendous. Uh, it was uh, finely detailed, but also bold enough that he felt it would really work well on the rough rag paper of the pulp magazines. Now, Finley quickly became a regular illustrator for Weird Tales, but he also did a lot of work for some of the other pulps as well. And just to give you an example of how fantastic this guy's artwork was, here's an example from the summer 1952 issue of Fantastic Story. This was an illustration for uh, uh, A.E. Van Vogt's Slan, and you can really see, if, you, if we zoom in here, just the exquisite detail that he could get uh, in, an, in a black and white illustration printed on, of all things, this ragged, rough pulp paper. If you wanted to read Marooned Off Vesta today and you don't have access to any of those old pulp magazines, you might want to pick up a copy of Asimov's Mysteries, and it's reprinted in there along with that uh, anniversary sequel to it as well. And Dell published the first paperback edition of Asimov's Mysteries in January of 1969, and it had cover art by one of my favorite illustrators of all time, John Berkey, and this was early in his career here, uh, but we can see, once again, he's depicting that same scene that uh, we've seen before of our astronaut uh, Warren Moore out there burning a hole in the water tank, and uh, uh, captures a different angle of it, and a, it's a, a different era here, it's obviously updated beyond anything that the first two artists have done. But Berkey had a knack somehow for capturing almost photorealistic uh, imagery with just really big, broad brushstrokes somehow, almost an impressionistic way of, of treating science fiction artwork. 
John Berkey got his start in St. Paul, Minnesota as an illustrator for an ad agency where he did mostly paintings for calendars depicting uh, scenes of American life and American history. Like a lot of illustrators for ad agencies back in those days, Berkey started to do some side work as a freelance illustrator for magazines and paperback book covers. And in 1972, he really made his mark with the, his uh, fantastic spaceship illustrations for Frederick Pohl's line of star science fiction anthologies. This is where he started to get away from his literal depictions of scenes out of stories and really just got to focusing and designing his spaceships and other fantastic craft that were really well designed, very realistic. You could really believe these ships are out there. Just look at the, the fine detail that he gets in there with just tiny little uh, paint strokes and, and things that just evoke some kind of detail that your mind fills in somehow. Very impressionistic and yet somehow photorealistic. Don't know how he did it. I, I've seen a lot of other illustrators try in years since copying his style. Nobody had the touch that he had though. So back in December of 1938, Isaac Asimov, remember that guy? He was still desperate to sell a story to Campbell for astounding science fiction. And at that time, Asimov was uh, working his way through college for a sociologist who was writing a book on the history of religious and social resistance to technological change. And Asimov was having to read a bunch of books on the subject for the sociologist. And it started to occur to him that maybe there was a science fiction story in there. What if you took that kind of religious and social resistance uh, to... Uh, a science fiction type of technological change, perhaps a flight to the moon. And uh, so Asimov ran with that, and he wrote a story called Ad Astra and took that in to sell it to Campbell. And uh, so Campbell accepted it, and Asimov didn't hear back from him right away like he was used to with, with Campbell. Uh, but instead, uh, Campbell reached out to him and asked him to come in, back into the office to discuss the story further. So in January, 1939 now, early January, uh, Asimov went back to Campbell's office where they chatted about it, and Campbell had been impressed with the whole social aspect of the story and wanted Asimov to rewrite the story, but to focus this time on the social and religious aspect not so much the science itself, but just the social resistance to the idea of uh, flying to the moon. So Asimov went back home and rewrote the story, he struggled with it, because he had never had to rewrite a story like that. But he managed to do it, then he took it back in, and uh, in, still in January, I believe, and Campbell bought it, he paid $69 for it, and Asimov finally had his first sale to astounding science fiction. Now, about this time, Marooned Off Vesta came out in Amazing Stories, uh, finally hit the stands, and uh, right on the heels of having sold his first story to Campbell, he, Asimov felt like he was on a roll. So he wrote then what he, uh, apparently was his 11th story, and he called it The Weapon Too Dreadful to Use. And he didn't feel like it was good enough to submit to Campbell. So he sent it to Amazing Stories again, and they bought it for $64. And this was in February of 1939. And in March, the May issue of Amazing Stories came out in March. Just six weeks after Asimov sent his story in, it was appearing in the magazine. That was a little quick for he thought. And he thought, hmm... He figured that there must have been, they bought the story because there was a hole in the next issue coming up. And his story, uh, the, the weapon too dreadful to use, was the right length. So he just kind of lucked out in sending a story in, uh, and a, a kind of a subpar story, he felt. And that's why it got published. But here it was out on the newsstands, and he had his second 
published story, his third to sell, but his second to actually appear on the newsstands in the May 1939 issue of Amazing. Isaac Asimov was still an unknown name at the time, so again, he got no mention on the cover. And as I say, Asimov himself did not care for the story a great deal, but I just reread it here recently, and I kind of liked it. I think it took some chances for its time. For one thing, it's set on Venus, and uh, Earth has colonized Venus, and has kind of taken it over with their advanced technology, and are ruling the Venusians in a sort of a repressed apartheid fashion. That seems to be uh, kind of an interesting idea for writing a story in those days. And then uh, also, uh, Earth, uh, Earthmen were the bad guys in the story, which is usually the other way around in science fiction tales of the day. And then another thing is the, uh, uh, the weapon too dreadful to use turns out to be an ancient Venusian artifact that they've hidden away from themselves, but have rediscovered it now, and are only daring to use it because of because they are so repressed by uh, the Earth's government. And what it can do is it strips the mind away from the brain. It disconnects mind from brain. And I, that's, that seemed familiar to me as a Star Trek fan. I remember Errand of Mercy, the first Klingon episode in the original series where they had the, the Klingon mind sifter, which seemed to do the same thing. I wonder if it was borrowed from this story or maybe other stories like that. But, and that kind of raised a question in my mind as far as the Star Trek episode goes. Whatever happened to that Klingon mind sifter? They had it in that first story. Did it ever show up anywhere else again in any of the subsequent stories ever? Well, I, that, I guess that's a topic for another video. But anyway, as I say, Asimov didn't care for the story as much as I kind of enjoyed it here recently. But neither did Asimov's good buddy, Frederick Pohl. He didn't like it either, and he was more than happy to tell Asimov why he didn't like it. For one thing, uh, the weapon too dreadful to use uh, is uh, it, towards the end of the story <clears throat> when they've they've used it on the Earthmen and Earth is trying to now make peace and so the Venusians agree to destroy the uh, the weapon that was too dreadful to use and then so that they can live in peace together and so that was the agreement but uh, once the weapon is destroyed Paul points out if if the weapon is gone now, what's to stop Earth from just taking him over again and, and ruling him forever? So there is a little flaw in the story there. And then also, just the title, The Weapon Too Dreadful to Use, they used it. So the title kind of belies the, the story itself. So those were some of the problems that, uh, that Paul had with it. Now, like I said, Asimov did not get mentioned on the cover, but of course his name is mentioned on the inside along with the story. And what else goes along with the story on the inside of Amazing Stories? Well, you guessed it, it's artwork. Here we have another nice double spread pen and ink drawing, this time by Julian S. Krupa. And he's depicting an Earthship here in the foreground watching uh, other Earthships that are closer to uh, landing or attacking Venus out in front of them here, falling under the influence of the dreadful, of the weapon too dreadful to use, and are are plummeting to their demise because all the crew in those ships have just had their minds extracted, disconnected from their brains. So there's no one flying the ship. They're just they're just mindless vegetables, really. And so, an interesting drawing here uh, by Julius, Julian S. Krupa. A little coarser in style, I think, than that of Fuqua or Finley, but uh, still a nice drawing overall. Krupa studied at the National Academy of Design and the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, uh, and uh, worked for Ziff Davis, which was based in Chicago. He, was, he did a few... Uh, full color covers, but he was mostly known for his pen and ink drawings, which he did a ton of. And he got his start in the same issue as uh, Fuqua did in that uh, October 1938 issue of Amazing. And uh, here is uh, one of the many interior illustrations he did for that uh, edition. 
he had no less than eight illustrations in his first issue there. And in the issue that The Weapon Too Dreadful to Use appeared in, he had seven illustrations in that issue. And then just to kind of bookend his career here, his last illustration ever to appear was in Amazing of January 1952 issue, and uh, he only had the one illustration in that one. So things were kind of tapering off through those years. But uh, you can kind of get a sense for his uh, consistency and continuity for, uh, for his uh, pen and ink illustrations. In June of 1939, the golden age of science fiction was finally upon us when the July 1939 issue of Astounding Science Fiction actually hit the newsstands. And uh, here we have it with uh, A.E. Van Vogt's Black Destroyer on the cover. Still no mention of Isaac Asimov on the cover. But on the inside, when Asimov picked this up, the, the issue that he had been looking forward to for so long, when he first picked this up and opened it up to find his story, he was surprised to see that Campbell had changed the title of his story, Ad Astra, changed it to Trends. Asimov liked the title change, trusting that Campbell would know a better title, so uh, uh, he was fine with that, with that uh, change-up. So as long as we've made it all the way to the golden age of science fiction, let's take a look at the artwork for Isaac Asimov's very first astounding story. This was illustrated by Paul Orban, and it depicts a moment in about halfway through the story where John Harmon's moon rocket is getting blown up by a religious zealot causing all kinds of havoc here. And that reminds me of a scene right out of Carl Sagan's Contact, where they had a religious zealot who infiltrates his way into the machine and uh, sabotages it and uh, blows the machine up uh, before it, it, can, it can get used. Um, I wonder if this was an influence on that. But uh, about the artwork itself here, uh, Orban's style is uh, usually nice and clean, but there's something about the proportions here of this guy in the foreground here, the, just the scale of his arm that's sticking straight up there compared to the size of his head seems wrong to me. And, and that's the thing that I focus on all the time for when I look at this, uh, this drawing here. Otherwise, it's a, it's a nice illustration. Paul Orban was born in 1896 in Budapest, and he and his family immigrated to the United States when he was very young to get away from the poverty in Hungary, and they landed in Chicago. And when he was 14 years old, he sold a watercolor to somebody for $5 and decided at that time that creating artwork and selling it was pretty easy money. So he wound up going to the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, and uh, after World War I, he got a job as an art director for a Chicago ad agency, and then started to sell his illustrations freelance uh, to the pulps. And he became quite well known as an illustrator for the Doc Savage magazine. And here's some examples of that. He's the one that did all those neat little woodcut uh, high school portraits of uh, Doc Savage and his gang there, as well as some really beautiful, uh, very large and detailed illustrations depicting scenes from the stories. He did these for years. One of the things that he loved to do that I really appreciate from almost all of these illustrators was that he loved to visualize the vague descriptions of the writer's scenes that he was given to illustrate. Uh, he was really a master at it. He also did a lot of similar work for the series for The Avenger and The Shadow over the years, as well as a number of other uh, non-series pulp magazine stories. And uh, so let's kind of wrap things up here. Believe it or not, we've, we've made it through Isaac Asimov's first three published stories where he finally dipped his toe into the golden age of science fiction. And uh, let's take a look at sort of a gallery of our three artists here and uh, take a quick little review. Across the top here, we have all three uh, illustrators for Marooned Off Vesta. There's quite a number of illustrations just for the one story there. But 
just compared side by side, you can really see the similarities between uh, the Robert Fuca artwork and the Virgil Finley artwork, almost identical. And in fact, uh, the first time I read the reprint in the uh, in the March 1959 issue, I didn't even notice that it was a different artwork. It, it's so similar. Of course, the full color John Berkey art there uh, really jumps off the page here. And then down below, we have the two individual stories, the weapon too dreadful to use, and then finally uh, Asimov's uh, uh, gold at the end of the rainbow there, Trends, his very first astounding story entry. So there you have it, folks. That was Isaac Asimov's entry into the golden age of science fiction. And uh, I always enjoy talking about the artwork and the stories behind the stories within the other stories. And there's just a lot of storytelling going on here. So uh, if you made it this far, I'm assuming you enjoy the artwork uh, retrospective. And uh, let me know in the comments below if you've got any favorite artists amongst these three stories here. Or if you've got any favorite artists in general, let me know who you like uh, to uh, uh, look at the artwork for. And maybe we'll try to do a video on, on that story or that artist or something. So a lot of these artists here, I think, are probably worthy of their own video just on the artists themselves. And I'll, I'll probably be doing something like that here one of these days, So uh, if you're good. So uh, uh, that's it. And uh, thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again, and we'll chat then. Thanks a lot.